lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. And then from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 3 through 17. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, We'll also come with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of, of the great number of fish. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he had stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but only about a hundred yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid, and fish placed on it in bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said to him, Shepherd my sheep. Then he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may, you may be seated. Thank you, brother. <laughs> All right. Can you bow your heads and let's be an answer to prayer. Almighty God, we pray that you speak to us through the Holy Spirit, the word that we need to hear, that we've grown our faith, grown our love for you, and that, Lord, uh, your purposes and your plan for this church, for each individual here, would be brought to fruition to the fullness of all that you intend and plan. We pray this now in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay, uh, this is actually a pretty uh, exciting sermon. I've, I've 
um, been encouraged by getting ready for it and actually did this at a Bible study just this week. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where I think God needs to speak into us, and it's an appropriate sermon to preach right after the resurrection, because this is the context. The disciples had just experienced resurrection. Jesus Christ, the, the rabbi that they thought was dead, buried, and, uh, buried and dead, and then he was gone, and then he came back to life, and then they met him, and they saw him, and, but then after that, they go back to fishing, okay? And it's kind of like, oh, let's just go back to activities, day-to-day -day life, uh, making a living. And I really believe the church needs to hear this message because I think God has a purpose for the church and we need to wake up and not think that we can go through something like the resurrection and stay the same. Something's got to change. And I really believe that it's appropriate or apropos for our church today because I really believe that we are very close to the fulfillment of God's promise in the second coming. So I think that we need to hear this word. Now, here's the interesting thing is that many times people think, well, I'm not a preacher, I, or I'm, I can't, I'm messed up, I'm, I'm blown it, I'm in perfections in my life, I've got issues. Get over yourself. We all have issues. I was talking about when I was in San Benito one time, and I was about ready to go and preach uh, that morning. And in every one of my offices, I have an altar. I have a, a prayer rail. And uh, candles and stuff like that set up a cross, and, and I pray at the rail. It's a functional rail. And um, and so I remember uh, that Sunday morning, my sermon was ready and done, and I got on my knees, and all of a sudden I started thinking about how bad I'd been that day before. I I was harsh with my wife, you know, and I always tell you. Chris and I never argue, but we do have periods of intense fellowship. <laughs> and it, it's, you know, I give up Jesus, and I can still say some things I regret. Anybody else here? You're going to leave me alone? Anybody else do that? I, I mean, because, you know, you get, you get, man, filled with the Holy Spirit, you Love Jesus, have a wonderful worship time to get in your car, and then you smack the kids around. You know? <laughs> stop it, would you stop it? It just, it just, like, it just kind of. And I remember getting on my knees, and, the, and, and I had apparently done either cheat off the kids or said something harsh to my wife. And I remember saying to the Lord at that prayer rail, and I've told you this before, I said, Lord, I am so unworthy to preach this morning. And I heard God inside me. It wasn't outside, it was inside me, but it was definitely God. And he said, when have you ever been worthy? <laughs> now that really encourages you. But see, the thing is, one thing God will show me, it's not about me, it's about him. It's about God's message. And I'm not, don't think, oh, he's going to come up with a big confession here. No, I'm not. Um, that's it. But the message that you've got to hear, the message we need to remember, is God is a God who uses imperfect people. My favorite example of, of a gospel preacher, someone who spoke the word of God in the scripture that no one was disappointed in, that never let anybody down after they spoke the word of God, was Balaam's donkey. Because Balaam's donkey spoke the word of God but he was still a donkey, and no one expected anything other than him being a donkey. Now, we have to keep that in mind in the church. A preacher is someone who is called by God, and a Christian is someone who is called by God, and will bring what God has given and invested in you to deliver, but the veracity of it is not based on the instrument, but on the God behind it. Okay, so Balaam's donkey never let anybody down. And so we have to remember that every time I preach, now I am doing the best to follow Jesus. I am trying to be sanctified. I'm trying to be holy. I'm striving. I want to have a heart totally surrendered to him. And I hope you're doing the same thing. Okay, but the whole point is my salvation and my righteousness is not where I find my peace. It's in his righteousness and his grace. And I am always a sinner saved by grace. And so are you. We're all sinners saved by grace. Now, 
All the people in Scripture that God used were imperfect people. They had issues. King David, I mean, he had issues. Abraham, all of them had issues. You know, I like I like Jacob because Jacob, I mean, the, he had to wrestle with God. Here he is trying to finagle his his blessing, and he wrestles with God. And and uh, during the middle of the night, when he's wrestling with God, God renames him and hits him in the hip. And from that day on, after he's been blessed by God, he limped. He's just like, you know, the rest of his life, he had a limp. Think about that. He said, what happened to you, Jacob? Oh, I've been blessed. <laughs> he touched me. He touched me. <laughs> his life was changed, but the guy had a limp. In fact, I had a preacher say one time, and I like this, never trust in a preacher or a teacher who doesn't have a limp. Someone who's never had problems. Someone, I can't stand it when I run in. I, I do accountability with preachers and such. I can't stand it when the preacher gets in my group and he never has a fight with his wife, never yells at his kids, never problems with the church. I said, well, get out of here then. You, go find another group. I need someone who's earthy. I need someone who will be either honest or has got issues so I can help. And you can help me because we all have issues, right? Uh, am I in the right group? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, now, here's a weird thing. This is a confession that we find in Scripture. One of my favorite passages, we talk about it all the time, Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6. He has this vision of seeing Jehovah Sabaoth, uh, high and lifted up. There's smoke filling the temple. There's, there's the glory of God and angels crying out, holy, holy, holy. It's the Lord of hosts. Kadosh, 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 Adonai, Salot. I mean, they're just, the worship's going on. The very foundations, everything's shaking and stuff. And he sees the glory of God. And in the midst of seeing the glory of God, what does he say? He goes, oh, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among the people of unclean lips. And I sit there and go, what? Is that a confession of sin? Unclean lips? Who have you been kissing? You know, I would, what, have you been rubbing your mouth on the floor or on a wall? What are you, unclean lips. What is that all about? Let me tell you something. I always thought that that's so bizarre. But look at God's looking for. God's looking for a messenger who's going to speak his word. Now, you need to keep in mind, you and I, are made in the image of God. You and I, you and I, in his image, have responsibility to be like God, to reflect God, to do God's bidding. There's a proverb that says this. Proverbs 18.21, it says, Light, death, and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. You know, we need to keep in mind that our mouths are instruments that are powerful. They're supposed to be instruments of life giving, not death giving. Instruments of blessing, not cursing. God created everything that there is by his spoken word. He said, let there be light, and what happened? There was light. He spoke it into existence. It's all by the word of God. We're made in his image. Then God calls on us to use our mouths. In fact, first job Adam had was to name the animals. I mean, that he's speaking. That's part of the creative process. God says your mouth needs to be an instrument of blessing, not of cursing, of life giving, of hope giving, of glory manifesting. You and I have that responsibility. With our mouths, we are called to bless the Lord. We are to declare His glory, His goodness, His, His holiness, His righteousness. And we're called to bless other people. You and I are called to bless our children, bless our spouses, bless our neighbors, bless our leaders. Oh, is it possible that ugly lips represents falling short? of what God called us to do in our mouths. Listen to what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. 
Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, that it may grace those who hear. You and I are called to speak grace, encouragement, blessing on people that hear. Don't let unwholesome things come out. Don't let curses come out. But we are called to declare his glory. Now, first of all, you have to keep in mind. He knows that you've got unclean lips. He knows that you've messed up. Jesus Christ came in the world to save who? Sinners. Not saints, because yet there aren't none. Sinners. He knows that we need him. And he knows that even after he catches us, that you and I are prone to mess up. Am I speaking to the right crowd? I hope I am. <laughs> Let me tell you something. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says that we, if you receive Christ, if you become a Christian, then you become a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. We need to hear that and believe that. And then he gives the people who were the sinners that he now makes into a new creation, he calls us to take the word of reconciliation. That is our ministry, the word of reconciliation, where we beg people to be reconciled to God because he did it for us. He's, he's still working on us. You're not done yet. I mean, God's still working on you. He's got, he's got a desire to shape you more into the image of of Jesus. Now this is the context of what God's doing. God is calling his people to let him sanctify you and to put the word of his glory of his love and mercy in your mouth. Okay? And that's the ministry that we have today with Isaiah where he's touched on the mouth with this chart like really you have to tell me I behold I've touched your mouth with this burning coal. Yeah, right. Okay. We'll get to that in a second. And then where Peter is brought back to the charcoal fire where he denied Jesus. Now I want you to picture this. God, it's so important to God because you are the hope, the church. God says pray for the church. He doesn't say pray for the world. He's praying for the church because the hope for the lost world is the church. It's the people of God. So this is, this is what he's focusing on. Now, when we look at Peter and his situation, we have to keep in mind that Jesus found Peter when he was out fishing. He had fished all night, caught nothing, cleaning his nets. Peter and his brother, James and John, they struck out. That's my fishing experience, striking out. Okay, then he comes and gets in the boat, puts out, does some teaching. He goes, now put out for a great catch. Peter doesn't want to do it. Lord, I'm going all night. The nets are clean. Really? You don't really want me to go out now? He says, put out for a great catch. They throw the nets out. The fish are so many that he has to call for James or John to help. And now both boats are trying to wrangle the, the nets. They're ripping, they fill up both boats, and both boats are about ready to sink, and all of a sudden they realize this is a miracle. I mean, this miraculous catch, this is the, this is not just a rabbi. Could this be the Messiah? And so Peter, this is what he says. Peter sees this great catch. In Luke 5, he says, But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at his feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. I mean, this is kind of like an Isaiah moment. What was me, for I'm a man of unclean lips? I did, I say, yeah, you're holy, I'm not. Get away from me. This is, this is the same sort of thing. But Jesus looks at this man on his feet, I mean, on his face, before him, before his feet, saying, get away from me, I am an unworthy, sinful man. And he says, do not fear, for soon you will be catching men. He wants to use that unworthy, sinful guy to catch men, not fish, men. Okay, we have to catch that context now. 
Now, Jesus, Peter stays with Jesus for three years. They're living together. He's been taught everything. It gets down to the very end. They do the Lord's Supper. After that, they're talking, and he <laughs> tells Peter that he's going to deny him three times. Jesus says this, though, to Peter. This is before Jesus is arrested. Okay? He says to Peter these words. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now, I want you to picture that. Remember, Jesus got him off his knees. He said, I'm going to make you catch men. He disciples him for three years. Before Jesus is going to be arrested and crucified, he tells him, Peter, Satan's coming after you. Now, let me tell you something real quick. If you have a preacher that will ever tell you that if you become a Christian, you don't have to worry about the devil, you're in trouble. Okay? Now, I want you to hear this. I just said that. But Satan is never going to mess with you because you're too small. Satan's messing with Peter. You might get a pipsqueak demon and say, oh, the devil's after me. And if you could see the size of that pipsqueak demon, you say, really? I'm giving that thing authority? Uh, listen, there, there's principalities and such. You're not going to get the big cheese. Peter got the big cheese. Now, did he say, don't worry, Satan can't touch you? First of all, Satan has to get permission to get you. Okay? He did not say Satan won't touch you. What he did say is don't worry. I prayed for you. I prayed for you. See, you got right now, Jesus is praying for you. Whatever you're facing, I don't care if it is the big cheese, the old ugliness himself. It doesn't matter because you've got Jesus praying for you. You've got the power of the resurrection within you. So you can handle this thing. Now what he says to Peter is he wants to sift you like we don't worry, I pray for you that your faith won't fail. And then when you turn again, what does turn again mean? That means that you've turned away for a bit. That you, so Satan got you, you're discouraged, you're going the wrong way. And when you turn again, strengthen your brother. Now I want you to picture this context because this is exactly what's happened. Peter does exactly what Jesus says. He denies him three times. He's so messed up that even after the resurrection, Peter, instead of encouraging his brother, goes, oh, let's go back to fishing. And he's dragging some of the disciples, seven of them, go off and are returning to life the way it was before they met Jesus. He's not doing it. He's going the wrong direction. Okay, this is our context. Now, I think it's real important that we have this experience that both Isaiah had and Peter had. Because when you experience God, you need to know that there's a reason. Please keep this in mind. If you're hurting and you messed up and you feel like a failure, God wants to heal you so that that is taken care of. But it's more than just for you. See, he's got a purpose for each of you. He's got a purpose and a plan. It's for what he wants to do in and through you for others, for the kingdom, for his glory, for lives to be transformed. God's got seeds of potential to make a difference in eternity here in this room. And so that's one thing you've got to keep in mind. It's not just so that you don't feel sorry. It's so that his power can be manifest in you. Now listen to what Isaiah says. He says, Woe well, is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among the people of unclean lips. The angel touches his mouth, and he says, Your sin's been forgiven. Your iniquity's taken away. And listen to what he says. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. That is what God's purpose is. He wants to use you. He wants every one of us to see here, say, here am I. Send me. Okay? So, I want to point out what God is 
looking for, what God desires, is unworthy witnesses. Because that's all he's got. Not one of us is worthy, but all of us are called to be witnesses for him. Now, the past seven weeks, I've preached on the, on the, the, the epistles of Jesus to the churches. And the last verse, every time, in every letter was... Let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. So here you go. I'm going to give you an ear. Ready? The first letter in ear is E. And the E is this. Every one of us needs an encounter with God. Somewhere, somehow, you need to realize that God is holy. You need to see God high and lifted. My prayer Every time we get together, it's not that we have great music. It's not that we have pretty buildings and stuff and good food and, and good preaching. No. It's that we have an encounter with God. I want us to realize that God is the almighty God and, and that we discover his worthiness, his glory, his majesty. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord, Jehovah, Sabaoth, high lifted up. His glory filled the place the foundation shook. Because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. My prayer is you see the Lord of hosts. So it's His worthiness. That's the E. The A is that you've got to acknowledge your unworthiness. It's not based on your goodness. It's not based on the fact that you are so cute. It is you acknowledge your unworthiness. God's standard, according to Matthew 5, 48, says, Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Not one of us is perfect. So we all fall short. In fact, Romans 3, 23 says, For all of us fall short. Right? For all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's, so there's no question of that. Isaiah, that's when he said, Woe is me, for I'm, I am one, because I am a man of unclean lips. Let me tell you something. You've got to admit that you've been wrong with God if you ever want a chance to be made right with God. Hmm. You've got to do that. Alcoholics Anonymous, if anybody's ever heard of that, the success comes in this. This is the number one failure. If you can't get step one, you are not going to get healed of alcoholism. You know what it is? Hey, hey. You need to admit that you are powerless. You're unable to manage it. You cannot do it. The number one obstacle between someone getting deliverance, whether it's alcohol or any other uh, kind of dependency, is you. Because if you think you can manage it, you don't need someone's help. If you can, you're not going to get it. But once you realize, I can't, I can't do it, then you have a chance to receive the healing of God. We've got to admit our unworthiness, our brokenness, our powerlessness. Okay, and the last one, that's so E, encounter, A, acknowledge, then the R, or the ear, is you need to receive. It's a free gift. You need to receive the transformation that God wants to give, the forgiveness he wants to give. You need to know that you've got it. It's all a gift. Somehow, somewhere in there, you need to know that when Jesus spoke on the cross in John 19, and he said, it is finished. It is finished. This cross means it's done. This is a symbol that it's been paid. Christ has been paid. What's so sad is when Christians talk about the cross and we sing amazing grace, but you still walk around with guilt and condemnation about things you've done in the past. Yeah. Get rid of it. That's not you anymore. You're a new creation. You gave that away. So give it away. Give it to God. Let him have it. In Isaiah, the angel takes a burning coal from the, from the altar, goes over to him with these burning coal and tongs, and touches his lips, and says, Behold, I touch your lips. He goes, Oh, really? I didn't know that. No, he knew that. I always wonder, why does he have to say that? Well, let me tell you why. Because I believe that there are Christians today that can sing Amazing Grace and say that they're sinners and we're saved, but still walk around like with puppies, feeling guilty and condemned and unworthy to declare the goodness of God. And Jesus is saying, I dealt with it, I died for it, get over it. You're no good to me if you will not allow me 
to give you my gift, and if you won't receive it, you need to receive it. He says, your sins are forgiven, your iniquity is taken away from you. You know what the second step in AA is? It's the higher power. Do you believe that there is a God who's going to lift you up? And you have to be dependent on that God. Okay, so those are the steps. That's the ear to hear. Let's look at the life of Peter. Because it boils down to this. Peter had an encounter with God. He acknowledged his unworthiness. And he received forgiveness. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Jesus saw the sinful man. He knew he was sinful. He knew he wasn't unworthy. He saw Peter fishing. And he went to get him as a fisher of men. Okay, he did a miraculous catch. They realized it was miraculous. Peter responds, says, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. He had fished all night and failed. And he says, do not fear, from now on you'll be catching men. What's interesting is, after three years of investment in him, after ups and downs, after seeing miracles and being called a fisherman, and then after seeing Jesus and knowing he had risen from the grave, now Peter is going back fishing. Something happened. So he, he, it was kind of like, I had this encounter with God. Um, but he says, it said, in John 21, Simon Peter said to the other disciples, remember Jesus said, when you turn back again, encourage your brethren to keep the faith, right? Because you're praying for your faith. And Simon Peter, instead of encouraging them, hey, let's keep doing what Jesus told us to do, he says, let's go back to doing what we did before. He says to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will come with you. And they went out and got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. And then Jesus shows up on the seashore. And he's cooking breakfast. And he sees them and he says, children, have you caught anything? Which is a really bad thing to say. Guys are fish all night and caught nothing. And they said, no. You know. And then he goes, well, cast your nets to the right for a great catch. And they did that. And when they got this great catch, now you know they're good fishermen because they said they were big fish. Right? That's a good. Big fish! All of them were big. You know? And they counted 153. And there's something significant about that, and I don't know the answer to it. Although I've done some research on it, I'll talk to you about it later. But uh, 153 fish, big fish. Okay? And then Peter, once they realized, that this is another miracle. This is the same miracle that Jesus did to get the fishermen the first time. Okay? I mean, not, it's not new. And then all of a sudden, John, and thank, John's the one who wrote this. John is the one who said, um, and the one who loved Jesus loved, that's me. I love John. He's so nice and humble about that. Said, it is the Lord. And Peter, when he heard it was the Lord, what does Peter do? Peter is stripped down to fish. So I see him as doing his uh, McConaughey imitation. Uh, and, and he's no shirt on, sweating for fish, showing his, his six pack, or, or most preachers, uh, uh, K. And so, anyhow, uh, he sh he's stripped down for work, fishing, and once he hears it's the Lord, what does he do? He puts his cloak on and then he jumps into the water and he swims to shore to get to Jesus. Now I want you to keep in mind, John, the one that Jesus loved, stayed in the boat, stayed in the boat. John reports that he's a faster runner than Peter because he got to the tomb first. Peter ain't going to be beat again. He's in the water and he's going. Now here's what I think is happening. I think Peter had taken off his clothing and he had gone back to life as normal. Like nothing had changed. And he went back to the attire of fishing, which is stripped down for that sweaty, dirty work. But once he realized it was Jesus, I believe the very cloak that he wore as a disciple who was sent out is what he put back on. I think it represents, oh wait, he's calling me back to discipleship. And he puts on that cloak of discipleship and he casts himself into the water. He's going to get to the shore as quick as he can. Now, 
Only a preacher will come up with this. I've never heard another one do it, but I think that others will do it. I really believe that him throwing himself into the water is remembering his baptism. Yeah, I want you to keep in mind, Peter's already been pulled out of the water by Jesus before. Peter jumps into the water with his discipleship cloak on him, jumps in, dripping wet. It's like renewing his baptism, and he comes to Jesus. This time, not saying, I am unworthy, but this time, receiving what Jesus has. What does Jesus have for him when he gets to the shore? What is he cooking? He's got fish and bread. This is what Jesus used, the feeding of the 5,000. The feeding of the 4,000. What did he ask his disciples for? Fish and bread. He took their meager offering and he fed the multitudes. Now he's got it. He's not short of fish and bread. He doesn't have a fishing net. He doesn't need it. He's the source of life. And now he's offering these disciples the fish and bread. He's going to feed them the miraculous food that he has from his resources and he's going to send them back out. He had to go catch his fishermen again because they were going off. Listen, the church, we have been practicing uh, Lent and Christmas and Easter for the past 2,000 years. And it's like we're really just doing that, but we've been fishing for fish. We've been trying to build buildings. We're trying to make budgets. We're, we've made it into a business. It's kind of like God needs to get his fishermen back. We need to eat of his resources the loaves of the fish that he has. Now what's really interesting, it says that he called Peter and he was cooking the fish on a charcoal fire. Now I want you to picture this. A light, I mean Isaiah, had an experience with charcoal. When he got his mouth burned, his lips purified, and his sins forgiven. Jesus is cooking the fish on a charcoal fire. Now, charcoal, the charcoal fire is only mentioned two times in the New Testament. The first time it's mentioned is where G, uh, Peter denies Jesus three times. Peter's warming himself in John 18 around a charcoal fire. Three times it denies him. And Jesus brings him to a charcoal fire, the very smell of it. Probably stimulated memories. I've been to that charcoal fire before, and I blew it. Memories of how he messed up, his damaged his emotion, his failure as a disciple said, I will never deny you, I will die with you. And Jesus said, He'll deny me three times. And it was around that charcoal fire, Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? He said, Yes, Lord, Lord, you know I love you. He said, be my sheep. Ask him, how many times? Three times. How many times did Peter deny him around the charcoal fire? Three times. Do you think it's a coincidence that Jesus wanted to make sure that memory was healed with three positive affirmations? The interesting thing is that Jesus says to Peter the first time, Peter! Do you love me? And he used the word, I got paid. I got paid. You are got paid me? Which is sacrificial love. It's a perfect love. It's the love that God has. And Peter says, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. But he doesn't use the word, I got paid. He uses the word, phileo, which is brotherly love. It's a lesser love. It's not like, I got paid, which is totally sacrificial. It's more on the human level. He goes, yes, Lord, you know I love you, phileo, you. And Jesus said, I want you to feed my sheep. Then he says to him a second time, Peter, do you like a pay me? And Peter goes, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. The third time, Jesus says, Peter, do you phileo me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. It's almost like Jesus is asking him to have his love for him as he has it for Peter. But Peter just can't, he can't get there. He can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I've got paid on you yet. And Jesus at the third one says, okay, I'll meet you with the love that you're able to give me. Will you fillet me? Peter goes, yes, I'll fillet This is interesting. 
But if you read on, and you read in 1 Peter, his first epistle that he wrote, you have to keep in mind, Peter denied him three times because he was under pressure. He was being tempted. It was a trial. It was a testing, and he failed. Listen to what Peter says to the disciples later on. Remember, he just he didn't encourage them. Jesus said, I want you to strengthen your brothers and encourage them. But he actually took them fishing and abandoned them. But in 1 Peter 1, listen to what it says. He says, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable even though tested by fire, may be found to result to the pray in praise and glory and honor at the re revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love agapeo him. He actually used the word agapeo in this encouragement to the brethren who are going to go through persecution. He says, you agapeo him, and though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. He got to a point where he could say, I could pay out and encourage other Christians who are going to be tested by trials to agapeo Jesus. See, it's a journey. Peter, Peter was wounded. Now, I want you to know something. I believe that Jesus brought him to a charcoal fire for healing. For a healing, not Peter, when Isaiah, he says, your sins are forgiven. Your iniquity is separated from you. They're done. I believe that's what Jesus was doing with Peter. But it was forgiveness, but there's promise. What we need to receive is not just the knowledge of our forgiveness, but a healing of our damaged emotions. A healing. So listen to what I believe that this is not the healing for his ministry, but the healing of, for his person. It's important. But see, it goes beyond that. Did you know how many times did Peter deny him? Three times. Three times. Did you know after this affirmation, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and in Acts chapter 2, he stood up to the very crowd that crucified Jesus, and he bowled us. He took a stand, and he said, you guys need to repent. You you crucified the Messiah. And if you repent, you will be saved. He did not deny him. He stood up. Second time, Peter stood up in Acts chapter 8 to the Samaritans. Proclaim the kingdom. The Samaritans had received Jesus. They had been baptized for the Holy Spirit had fallen on them until Peter came and laid his hands on them. And the Samaritans came into the kingdom Peter was there. The third time, Jesus found Peter in Joppa. And he said, I want you to go to Cornelius the South, and I want you to preach. And he preaches a terrible sermon. It's not a very good sermon. And in the middle of the sermon, the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles, and they get saved. Three people groups, Jew, Gentile, Samaritans, and the Gentiles, are all saved when Peter came and took his stand and laid his hands on people. I believe that was the purpose of God. If you watch the Wednesday, po Wednesday podcast, I'm going to show how this is a fulfillment of a blueprint set in, in motion in Genesis for Peter to fulfill the scripture that says God has works, good works for us to walk in, prepared beforehand that you would walk in them. And I believe he's got those for you. So if you watch on Wednesday, I'm going to flesh that out for you. And you will see how you might be walking in a purpose that God has prepared beforehand that you can't even conceive. But God is the one who's at work. So I want to close with this. God is a God who wants to use this church. He knows you're not perfect. He knows you struggle. You know what he wants? He wants somebody who will step up and just speak. I mean, are you more articulate than the average donkey? <laughs> I mean, we have to set a standard sometimes. <laughs> Dang. 
Jesus has said, listen, if my people won't even do it, then I'll get rocks to do it. Do you have more intelligence than a rock? Don't listen to what your, your sister or brother told you when you were a kid. Okay. okay, here we go. Church, you don't have to know anything. Or Let me tell you something. When I was at, at A&M, Paul was at A&M, we got, became Christians within a couple of weeks of each other. And uh, I was in charge of a Bible study at Aldersgate United Methodist Church on the church camp in Palestine. And the lesson that we had had to do with divorce. I went, oh, no, what do I do? I don't even know what I think about this. Oh, what? And there was a guy in a, in a Bible study with one of the kids, and his dad's a Methodist preacher, and he was getting a divorce, and I didn't know what to say about it. And I went, oh, I don't understand these passages, and I'm just a kid, and I don't know anything. I said, oh, I need help. I need, I, need, I need someone to help me. And so I, I told you this story. I prayed to God, show me someone who would give me counsel. And there was another counselor there that just made me see Jesus all over. Have you run into someone like that? Or they just, you know, let me tell you something. You can be a Christian and be a sourpuss and suck the life out of people. I'm going to just tell you something. I can go make visits, and some people and I come up and like, oh, I need a shower. <laughs> you know? And they're a Christian, and they might be a nice person. But there's also, you can be dying of cancer and so filled with the Holy Spirit. I come out on cloud nine going, wow, man, I went to minister, but the Holy Spirit got me through that person. And, I, and so anyhow, this guy glowed Jesus. Man, he was just all over. And I went, oh, man. And I said, would you help me? The, 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 I really believe God showed me to talk to you about this question. My Bible study has to do on this divorce passage. I didn't know what to do with it. Can you help me? And he goes, I can't believe you're talking to me. I said, well, that's not a good intro. What, what do you mean? He goes, I don't know what to tell you, but I've been, I've been divorced five times. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> did I hear the Holy Spirit or what? And he goes, I don't know why you're talking to me. And I said, well, I don't know, but I felt like God said to talk to you about it. He goes, let me tell you something. I'm not proud of what I've gone through, and, I, and I, I'm hurting for it. I hated it. This is a brokenness, a weakness in my life. But one thing I've learned about this is this. I'm not here to justify marriage or uh, divorce and, and all that. What I am here to say is this. God is a God of reconciliation. And he takes broken and sinful people and he meets them where they're at. And so I'm not here to justify my path, but I'm here to tell you that God is a God of forgiveness. You know what? I can preach that. I can preach that. Hmm. I don't have to understand well, those passages, I've got insight now, but I, all I need to know is that God is a God who takes broken people, hurting people, and guess what? God led me to that guy who had brokenness in his life, and he spoke life into me. I don't remember half the sermons that I've heard from great preachers, but I remember that word that that broken man gave me. Church, he's calling on you to have the ministry of reconciliation. We sing this hymn. Maybe you all know it. It goes, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, the same, the what? No, no, no. No, no, no. Not a wretch. Come on. It's not a wretch. Let's get it right. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, the same, the what? Wretch. Like you. Like you. Thank God. <laughs> Listen, we got to get it right. Save the wretch like me. I was, I was in, a, in a, a service. I was standing there to another preacher. And, and they were singing that song. And it got to that part. And I say, and save the wretch like Paul. <laughs> and he stopped singing. He goes, hey, what are you doing? I said, it's true, isn't it? He said, well, yeah, but it doesn't sound good when you say it. <laughs> I said, get over yourself, man. See, that's just it. It's a wretch like me. I've got to own the wretchedness. I've got to own it and realize that he wants the wretches to sing the glory of God. And it's not about you. You don't make his message right. Pharaoh's <laughs> donkey still stunk. He's still a donkey. But it was the word of God out of the mouth of the donkey. And God needs you to let his grace and forgiveness heal you so you can take his word into your mouth because God wants to use sinners. And you know what you need to do to qualify as a sinner that can be used by God? is for you to say, here am I. 
send me. Period. You qualify yeah. as a sinner who's willing to speak the word of God. Hmm. Now here's the thing. I believe that every one of us, God's got someone in mind for you to speak to. That no one else is going to be able to reach like you can. I've been at a mass watch when someone gets us personal letters from a key person. <laughs> Holy Spirit nails them from a letter that they're reading and they go, and yet they got a bunch of different letters from different people, but one in particular letter just because they had the key. God had that purpose, that connection, and that anointing on it. And I believe that God wants to do that in and through you. And you need to bring somebody, somebody closer to Jesus. And he's counting on you. And guess what? Don't let Satan say, you're not worthy. You know what the argument is with that? You're right. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm not worthy. And that's why God's not going to be disappointed with me when I go forward. That's why I love Peter. Peter always opened his mouth and fell down. But you know what you can do? Open your mouth, fall down, open your mouth, fall down. Some people do stuff like that. And you still make it around the room. That's what God's looking for in you. So I close with this passage. It says, do not, uh, when I first read this, I was insulted. But it's so true. Uh, first Corinthians. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. You know what you are? You are God's secret weapon. Because he's called you imperfections, buzzy, <laughs> distortion, cracks and all, to be used by him to share this glory. And he's counting on you simply to respond. Here am I. Say that. Would you bow your heads and let's pray. Oh Lord God. <laughs> oh. Thank you. If you use the broken, the weak, the messed up to declare your glory. Forgive us for thinking that something that we have that makes us special that is qualifies us rather than simply your love and your invitation. We pray that you'd help us. Help us to have the faith to receive that healing, take hold of that charcoal, and to say, it is finished. And now I'm going on. And I'm going to do something for the kingdom. Do something for my king. Help us to trust in you that much. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Church, the prayer team is going to come and they're going to close this out.